Good day everyone. Our lecture for today is about testicular cancer. The objectives of this lecture are the following. To review the pathway of management and principles in testicular cancer. To review the NCCN, EAU, and AUA guidelines in testicular cancer. To provide post-lecture test questions to test the stock knowledge and lessons learned about testicular cancer based on Campbell's book. The diagnosis of testicular cancer is based on clinical examination of the testes and general examination to rule out enlarged nodes or abdominal masses. Ultrasound of both testes with Doppler should be performed whenever a testicular tumor is suspected. An additional ultrasound of the retroperitoneum is recommended to screen for extensive retroperitoneal metastasis. Ultrasound of both testes should also be performed in patients with retroperitoneal mass and or elevated tumor serum markers without a palpable scrotal mass. Testicular microlithiasis in the absence of solid mass and risk factors for developing GCT does not confirm an increased risk of malignant neoplasm and does not require further evaluation. Serum tumor markers both before and five to seven days after orchiectomy, AFP and HCG and LDH the latter is mandatory in advanced tumors. Patients with normal serum tumor markers, HCG and AFP, and indeterminate findings on physical exam or testicular ultrasound for testicular neoplasm should undergo repeat imaging in 6 to 8 weeks. Prior to definitive management, patients should be counseled about the risk of hypogonadism and infertility and should be offered sperm banking when appropriate. In patients without normal contralateral testes or with known subfertility, this should be considered prior to orchiectomy. In gunal exploration and orchiectomy with end block removal of testes, tunica albuginea, and spermatic cord. If the diagnosis is not clear, a testicular biopsy is to be taken for histopathological frozen section. Organ sparing surgery can be attempted in special cases like bilateral tumor or solitary testes. Routine contralateral biopsy for diagnosis of carcinoma in situ should be discussed with the patient and is recommended in high-risk patients with testicular volumes less than 12 ml, a history of cryptorchidism, suspicious intratesticular mass, and age less than 40 years. In patients with newly diagnosed GCT, clinicians must obtain a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast or MRI if CT is contraindicated. In patients with newly diagnosed GCT, clinician must obtain chest imaging. In the presence of elevated rising post-orchiectomy markers, HCG and AFP, or evidence of metastasis on abdominal or pelvic imaging, chest x-ray or physical exam, a CT chest should be obtained. In patients with clinical stage 1 seminoma, clinicians should preferentially obtain a chest x-ray or over a CT scan. In patients with non seminomatous germ cell tumor, clinicians may preferentially obtain a CT scan of the chest over a chest x-ray and should prioritize CT chest for those patients recommended to receive adjuvant therapy. In patients with newly diagnosed GCT, clinicians should obtain a PET scan for, for staging. Patients should be assigned a TNMM category to guide management decisions. Principles in management. Management decisions should be based on imaging obtained within the preceding four weeks and serum tumor markers HCG and AFP within the preceding 10 days. Management decisions should be made in a multidisciplinary setting involving experienced clinicians in urology and medical oncology radiation oncology, pathology, and radiology. Expert review of pathologic specimens should be considered in clinical scenarios where treatment decisions will be impacted. In patients with normal serum tumor markers, ECG and AFP, and equivocal imaging findings for metastasis, clinicians may consider repeat imaging in 6 to 8 weeks to clarify the extent of disease prior to making a treatment recommendation. In seminoma, clinicians should recommend Surveillance after, after orchiectomy for patients with stage 1 seminoma. Adjuvant radiotherapy and carboplatin-based chemotherapy are less preferred alternatives. 
For patients with stage 2A or 2B seminoma with a lymph node less than 3cm or equal, clinicians should recommend radiation therapy or multi-agent cisplatin-based chemotherapy based on shared decision-making. For patients with 2B seminoma with a lymph node more than 3cm, chemotherapy is recommended. Non-seminoma management. Clinicians should recommend risk-appropriate multi-agent chemotherapy for patients with non-seminomatous germ, germ cell tumor with elevated and rising post-orchectomy serum AFP or HCG. Clinicians should recommend surveillance for patients with stage 1A non-seminomatous germ cell tumor, RPLD, RPLND, or one cycle of bleomycin, etoposide, and cisplatin chemotherapy are effective and appropriate alternative treatment options for patients who decline surveillance or are at risk for non-compliance. For patients with, with stage 1B non-seminomatous germ cell tumor, Clinicians should recommend surveillance, RPLND, or one or two cycles of bleomycin, etoposide, and cisplatin chemotherapy based on shared decision-making. Patients with stage 1 non-seminomatous germ cell tumor and any secondary somatic malignancy, also known as teratoma, with malignant transformation in the primary tumor at orchectomy should undergo RPLND. Clinicians should recommend RPLND or chemotherapy for patients with stage 2A non-seminomatous germ cell tumor with normal post-orchectomy serum, AFP, and ACG. In patients with clinical stage 2B non-seminomatous germ cell tumor and normal post-orchectomy serum, AFP, and ACG, clinicians should recommend risk-appropriate multi-agent chemotherapy. Clinicians may offer RPLND as an alternative to chemotherapy to select patients with clinical stage 2B non-seminomatous germ cell tumor with normal post-orchectomy serum, AFP, and HCG. Among patients who are candidates for RPLND, it is recommended that clinicians consider referral to an experienced surgeon at a high-volume center. Surgeons with experience in the management of germ cell tumor and expertise in minimally invasive surgery may offer minimally invasive RPLND, acknowledging the lack of long-term data on oncologic outcomes. Primary RPLND should be performed in, with curative intent in all patients. RPLND should be performed with adherence to anatomical principles regardless of the intent to administer adjuvant chemotherapy. These principles are applied to both open and minimally invasive approaches. Follow-up The primary aim of follow-up in the first five years is the timely diagnosis of recurrent disease in order to be able to treat the patient with curative intent with the least aggressive therapy. Interval between examinations and duration of follow-up should be consistent with the time of maximal risk of recurrence. Tests should be directed at the most likely sites of recurrence and have a good accuracy. The increased risk of second malignancy in the primary site and in other tissues that may have been exposed to the same carcinogens or in which there is epidemiological evidence of increased risk should also guide the selection of, te of the tests. Non-malignant complications of therapy must also be considered. Follow-up for pure seminoma stages 1A and 1B after primary treatment. Although no single follow-up plan is applicable to all patients, the NCCN panel has provided guidance for the follow-up of patients with testicular GCTs for the first five years after the completion of therapy. These recommendations may be individualized and extended beyond five years at the discretion of the physician. Follow-up strategies for patients with stage 1 seminoma vary according to the treatment modality received by the patient, surveillance versus adjuvant therapy. Follow-up for patients with stage 1 seminoma managed with active surveillance after orchectomy includes a history and physical examination with optional measurement of serum tumor markers performed every three to six months for the first year, every six months for the year two, and every six to 12 months for the year three, and annually four years, four, and markers is optional due to the rarity of marker-only relapse, since post-op patients with elevated markers will also have evidence of relapse on imaging. There is controversy regarding how many imaging studies should be performed in patients on active surveillance. The NCCN panel recommends an abdominal pelvic CT scan with or without contrast at 3, 6, and 12 months during the first year, every 6 months for year 2, 
every 6 to 12 months for year 3 and then every 12 to 24 months for years 4 and 5. CT is not recommended beyond 5 years unless clinically indicated. The MRI protocol should include visualization of all the nodes that need to be assessed including the retroperitoneal and pelvic nodes and should be performed in centers with experience in interpreting MRI results for testicular cancer. The same imaging modality, CT or MRI, should be used throughout the surveillance. Routine chest imaging, including chest x-ray and chest CT with contrast, should be reserved for patients with thoracic symptoms. Follow-up after adjuvant treatment. Follow-up of patients treated with adjuvant therapy, chemotherapy, or RT includes a history and physical examination with optional measurement of post orchiectomy serum tumor markers performed every 6 to 12 months for the first 2 years and annually for years 3, 4, and 5. The NCCN panel recommends performing an abdominal pelvic CT scan with or without contrast annually for the first 3 years only. In select circumstances, an MRI can be considered to replace an abdominal pelvic CT. The MRI protocol should include visualization of the retroperitoneal and pelvic nodes and should be performed in centers with experience in interpreting MRI results for testicular cancer. The same imaging modality should be used throughout the surveillance. Chest x-rays should be obtained only when clinically indicated and chest CT scans with contrast should be considered for symptomatic patients. CT is not recommended beyond 5 years unless clinically indicated. Relapse tests are treated according to, sh to the should not be treated based on upon the elevated LDH level alone. Follow-up for pure seminoma stage 1S. The NCCN panel recommends repeating measurements of serum tumor markers and performing imaging studies, chest, abdominal, pelvic CT, with contrast to scan for evaluable disease. Follow-up for pure seminoma stage 2A and non-bulky 2B after primary treatment. The recommended follow-up schedule for patients with stage 2A and non-bulky stage 2B seminoma after RT or chemotherapy includes a history and physical examination with optional measurement of post orchiectomy serum tumor markers performed every 3 months for year 1 and every 6 months for years 2 through 5. An abdominal pelvic CT scan with contrast is recommended at 3 months and 6 to 12 months for year 1, annually for years 2 and 3 and then as clinically indicated for years 4 and 5. In select circumstances, an MRI can be considered to replace an abdominal pelvic CT. The MRI protocol should include visualization of the retroperitoneal and pelvic nodes and should be performed in centers with experience in interpreting MRI results for testicular cancer. The same imaging modality, CT or MRI, should be used throughout surveillance. The CT is not recommended beyond 5 years unless clinically indicated. Chest x-ray is not recommended every 6 months or chest x-ray is recommended every 6 months for first 2 years only. Chest x-ray may be used for routine follow-up, but chest CT with contrast is preferred in the presence of thoracic symptoms. Follow-up for pure seminoma bulky stage 2 and stage 3 after chemotherapy. The recommended follow-up schedule for patients with bulky stage 2 or stage 3 seminoma after treatment with chemotherapy includes a history physical examination as well as measurement of serum tumor marker levels every 2 months for year 1, every 3 months for year 2, every 6 months for years 3 and 4, once during year 5. Abdominal pelvic CT scans with contrasts are recommended every 4 months for year 1, every 6 months for year 2, annually for years 3 and 4, and then as clinically clinical circumstances, an MRI can be considered to replace an abdominal pelvic CT. The MRI protocol should include visualization of the retroperitoneal and pelvic nodes and should be performed in centers with experience in interpreting MRI results for testicular cancer. The same imaging modality should be used throughout surveillance. The chest x-ray is, is recommended every two months for year one every three months for year two and annually for years three through five while chest x-ray may be used for routine follow-up chest ct with contrast is preferred for patients with thoracic symptoms or residual masses or nodules in the chest patients with residual masses may require more frequent imaging based on clinical judgment however ct is not recommended beyond five years unless clinically indicated since viable tumor cells have been found in tumors more than 3 cm 
with a negative post chemotherapy that patients with a residual mass measuring 3 cm and negative PET results after chemotherapy should undergo an abdominal pelvic CT scan with contrast every six months for first year and then annually for five years. Follow up for non seminoma stage 1 without risk factors. The long term follow up for stage 1 non seminoma patients without risk factors includes a history and physical examination, serum tumor marker assessment, abdominal, pelvic CT scan, and chest x ray. In select circumstances, an MRI can be considered to replace an abdominal and pelvic CT. The MRI protocol should include visualization of the retroperitoneal and pelvic nodes and should be performed in centers with experience interpreting these results. The same imaging modality should be used throughout surveillance. All imaging in this setting is performed with contrast. The frequency of this test varies with primary treatment modality received by the patient. It should be noted that routine chest x-ray may have limited value for detecting relapse in stage 1 non-seminoma patients. Chest x-ray is not indicated in years 3, 4, and 5 for stage 1 non-seminoma patients without risk factors treated with adjuvant BEP or primary RPLND. Follow up for non-seminoma stage 1 with risk factors. The long-term follow-up for stage 1 non-seminoma patients with risk factors includes history and physical exam, serum tumor marker assessment, chest x-ray, and abdominal pelvic CT scan. In select circumstances, an MRI can be considered to replace an abdominal and pelvic CT. The MRI protocol should include visualization of the retroperitoneal and pelvic nodes and should be performed in centers with experience interpreting MRI results for testicular cancer. The same imaging modality should be used throughout surveillance. All imaging in this setting is performed with contrast. Chest X-ray may be used for routine follow-up, but chest CT with contrast is preferred in patients with thoracic symptoms. Follow-up for non-seminoma stage 2A. The long-term follow-up for stage 2A non-seminoma patients includes a history and physical examination serum tumor marker assessment, chest x-ray, and abdominal pelvic CT. In select circumstances, an MRI can be considered to replace an abdominal pelvic CT. The MRI protocol should include visualization of the retroperitoneal and pelvic nodes and should be performed in centers with experience in, with experience in interpreting MRI results. The same imaging modality, CT or MRI, should be used throughout surveillance. All imaging in this setting is performed with contrast. The frequency of this test varies with the primary treatment modality and post-surgical management received by the patient. Chest x-ray may be used for routine follow-up, but chest CT with contrast is preferred in patients with thoracic symptoms. Follow-up for non-seminoma stage 2B. The long-term follow-up schedule for stage 2B non-seminoma patients is similar to the follow-up schedule outlined for patients with stage 2A non-seminoma and is dependent upon the primary treatment modality and post-surgical management received by the patient. Follow-up for good, intermediate, and poor-risk non-seminoma. The long-term follow-up for patients with good, intermediate, and poor-risk non-seminoma after chemotherapy with or without post-chemotherapy RPLND includes history PE, serum tumor marker assessment, chest x-ray, and abdominal pelvic CT. Patients who have an incomplete response to chemotherapy require more frequent imaging than is outlined in the table. Patients who undergo RPLND and are found to have PN0 disease or PN1 pure teratoma need only one CT scan at postoperative month 3 to 4 and then as clinically indicated. In select circumstances, an MRI can be considered to replace an abdominal pelvic CT. All imaging in this sit setting is performed with contrast. Chest x-ray may be used for routine follow-up, but chest CT with contrast is preferred in patients with thoracic symptoms. Second line and subsequent therapy for metastatic germ cell tumors. Patients with disease relapse following first line therapy or those who do not experience a durable complete response to first line therapy should receive second line therapy. Patients with recurrent disease who have not been treated with prior chemotherapy 
should be managed per their risk status. It is preferred by the panel that patients with recurrent non-seminoma be treated at centers with expertise in the management of this disease. Second-line therapy options for patients with early relapses within two years of the completion of primary therapy include enrollment in a clinical trial, which is preferred, conventional dose chemotherapy or high-dose chemotherapy. If chemotherapy is given, both conventional dose and high-dose regimens are preferred in this setting. The conventional dose regimens are TIP or high-dose carboplatin plus etoposide followed by paclitaxel plus ifosfamide followed by high-dose carboplatin plus etoposide may be considered if the recurrent mass is a solitary, non -rese solitary resectable site. After completion of primary therapy occur in 2-3% to of testicular cancer survivors for this patient if the unresectable chemotherapy is the preferred option. Clinical trial enrollment is also an option for patients with unresectable late relapses. Third-line therapy. Participation in a clinical trial is the preferred treatment option for patients who experience relapse following first and second-line therapy. Alternatively, patients previously treated with conventional dose chemotherapy can receive high-dose regimens or be considered for surgical salvage if the recurrent mass is in a solitary resectable site. Alternative options for patients previously treated with high-dose regimens include conventional dose salvage chemotherapy, surgical salvage if solitary resectable site, and microsatellite instability mismatch, mismatch repair MSI MMR testing if disease progresses after high-dose chemotherapy or third-line therapy. The preferred treatment option for patients who experience a late relapse more than two years after completion of second-line therapy is surgical salvage. If the recurrent mass is resectable, conventional dose or high-dose chemotherapy, if not previously received, are also options for patients with relapse. In order to maintain optimal efficacy and limit treatment-related toxicities, the chemotherapy regimens previously received by the patient should be considered when deciding on third-line therapy options. High-dose chemotherapy is the preferred third-line option if it has not been previously received. If high-dose chemotherapy was previously received by the patient, then palliative chemotherapy is the preferred third-line treatment option. Additionally, the panel considers pembrolizumab immunotherapy to be useful in certain circumstances. The recommended third-line palliative chemotherapy options for patients with intensively pretreated cisplatin-resistant or refractory GCTs are combinations of gemcitabine with paclitaxel or gemcitabine and oxaliplatin or gemox. Treatment of brain metastasis Brain metastasis from testicular GCTs are relatively rare and occur almost exclusively in patients with non-seminoma of brain metastasis may be more common in patients with higher burden of systemic disease, lung, liver, and or bone metastasis, high levels of serum beta ECG, and in those who experience relapse after cisplatin-based chemotherapy. The prognosis of patients with brain metastasis from testicular GCTs is poor, with more than 50% of patients dying within one year of with but with additional adverse prognostic factors, especially those with metachronous brain metastasis, have even worse outcomes. The optimal management of brain metastasis from testicular GCTs is controversial. With a lack of evidence from prospective trials to guide treatment decisions, therefore, management decisions are usually based on institutional preferences which may in part explain the large variation in treatment and modalities received by these patients. The NCCN guidelines recommend primary cisplatin-based chemotherapy for patients with brain metastasis. The addition of RT to chemotherapy regimens can also be considered. Surgical resection of metastatic brain lesions should be performed if clinically indicated and feasible. Quality of life and long-term toxicities after cure. Patients diagnosed with testicular cancer are usually between 
18 and 40 years at diagnosis, and life expectancy after cure extends over several decades. Before any treatment is planned, patients should be informed of common long-term toxicities. During follow-up, patients should be screened and treated for known risk factors such as high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, and testosterone deficiency. When follow-up by the clinical expert is discontinued, a written cancer survivorship plan addressing late toxic effects, lifestyle recommendations, recurrent risks, and cancer-specific follow-up might be helpful. Our lecture for today is about penile cancer. Here are the following objectives. To review the natural history, presentation, etiology, prevention, and diagnosis of penile cancer. To review the NCCN and EAU treatment guidelines in penile cancer. To provide post-lecture test questions to test the stock knowledge and lessons learned about penile cancer based on Campbell's book. HPV infection among men is associated with penile carcinoma. Giant condyloma of Bush Lowenstein are locally progressive HPV-related tumors that are non-metastatic but require complete excision and follow-up. The potential for coexisting or premalignant degeneration to squamous carcinoma has been shown, manifesting as three differ differing clinical entities including bowenoid papillosis, Bowen's disease, and erythroplasia of kerat. Bowenoid papillosis, papillosis occurs on the shaft of young men in most cases and does not progress to invasive disease. Progress, uh, progression to invasive carcinoma in men with bowenoid disease and erythroplasia of kerat may occur in 5 to 10 to 33% of patients respectively. If it is not treated, if it is not treated. Metastasis has, ra has rarely occurred. Cancer eradication with organ preserving strategies is the goal of the therapy. A diagnosis of pen penile Kaposi sarcoma is often associated with human herpes virus 8 and should prompt an investigation in whether the patient is also infected with, with HIV or otherwise immunocompromised. Penile cancer often begins on the surface of the glans penis or in the preputial area where it is progressively enlarges. Delay in seeking medical attention and then in subsequent definitive biopsy is common. Examination of the penile primary tumor in the inguinal region is critical to treatment planning. Metastasis occurs by embolization of tumor deposits from the penile tumor through penile lymphatics to the inguinal lymph nodes. This metastasis occurs late in the history of the disease. Penile cancer is rare in developed countries and varies worldwide with age, circumcision, HPV exposure, and lifestyle hygiene practices. Recent epidemiological data from the United States suggest a disparity in incidence and outcome of penile cancer for Puerto Rican Hispanic men. Risk factors for development of penile cancer include lack of neonatal circumcision, phimosis, HPV infection, exposure to tobacco products, penile like, uh, lichenesclerosis, and potentially penile trauma. Penile cancer represents a preventable disease in most cases via neonatal circumcision, HPV vaccination, and or behavior modification. Adequate tumor biopsy is essential to diagnosis and treatment planning. Squamous carcinoma histologic subtypes has recently been classified into two major groups by their relationship to HPV and show distinct morphologic features and clinical behavior. Pathologic description of anatomic structures invaded, the grade and the status of vascular and perineural invasion provide important information to assess the risk of metastasis. Soft tissue detail of penile tumors is best imaged by MRI. Physical examination provides the most reliable staging information for small distal lesions. Penile MRI, especially performed in a combination with artificial erection, may provide unique staging information when physical examination findings are equivocal. 
physical examination of the inguinal region remains the clinical gold standard for evaluating the presence of metastasis in the non-obese patient. CT or MRI can be useful in evaluating the inguinal region of obese patients and in those who have had prior inguinal surgery. Among patients with proven inguinal metastasis, CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis may help to determine those patients with poor prognostic features for cure with surgery alone. PET CT may be useful among patients with clinically detected inguinal metastasis to define the presence of pelvic or distant metastasis. Staging Clinical and pathologic factors related to the presence and extent of lymph node involvement of the determine survival and should be recorded. The current 8th edition unified TNM staging system represents a consensus document that includes clinical and pathologic, pathologic descriptors that provide important prognostic information. Patients with small lesions of low grade and stage, TIS, TA, T1, grade 1, and grade 2, are the optimal candidates for organ preservation to maintain sexual quality of life. The goals of organ preservation are to maintain glandular tissue for sensory purposes when possible and or to maintain penile length when glans penis preservation is not possible. Surgical modalities include limited excision strategies, most surgery, and laser ablation. Local recurrence rates overall after organ preservation are higher than with traditional amputation. However, when local recurrences are detected and treated, early survival does not appear to be adversely affected. Amputation remains the standard for large or deeply invasive lesions to gain rapid tumor control. The presence and extent of inguinal metastasis determines survival in penile cancer. Patients with persistent palpable inguinal adenopathy should undergo an ultrasound or CT-guided inguinal biopsy followed by management appropriate for the clinical scenario. On the basis of the histologic features of the primary tumor, the risk of lymph node metastasis can be assessed in patients with no palpable adenopathy based upon the TNM staging system. Dynamic sentinel node biopsy, superficial inguinal lymph node dissection, or close follow-up can be recommended based on the TNM stage and other histologic features. Factors associated with a high cure rate in surgically treated patients include no more than two inguinal metastases, unilateral involvement, no extranodal extension of cancer, and the absence of sense of pelvic metastasis. Patients with higher volumes of disease should be considered for adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy. Morbidity of lymphadenectomy is decreasing in contemporary series. Superficial inguinal lymph node dissection reliably determines the presence of microscopic inguinal metastasis without the need for specialized facilities but can have significant morbidity. Modified dy dynamic sentinel node biopsy techniques to determine microscopic inguinal disease exhibit low morbidity have been validated externally in higher volume centers and are now recommended procedure in such centers. Laparoscopic and robotic inguinal lymph node dissection obtains lymph node yields that are comparable with those of open techniques. When used in selected patients and are on appropriate staging procedure in clinical lymph node negative patients. Additional studies with larger patient numbers and longer follow-up are required before routine adoption in clinical practice among patients with clinically positive inguinal lymph nodes. Pelvic lymph node dissection is now recommended when more than one lymph node when more than one inguinal lymph node exhibits metastasis or when extranodal extension of cancer is present. Radiation provides an effective penile preserving approach for T1, T2 squamous cell carcinomas sm smaller than 4CM using either external beam radiotherapy or bracket therapy. Because 20% of recurrences occur after 5 years, continued follow-up is required as salvage menectomy for persistent or recurrent disease may be curative. The criteria for surgical staging of inguinal lymph nodes are the same whether patients undergo primary radiation or primary surgical management. Unresectable lymph nodes may be rendered operable by neoadjuvant chemotherapy or chemoradiation.
Integration of radiation surgery and chemotherapy in advanced disease is being investigated in a prospective international randomized trial, IMPAC EA8134. Palliative radiotherapy may be beneficial for metastatic disease. New adjuvant chemotherapy, which is platin containing regimen, should be considered for patients with lymph node metastasis. As responses in this setting may facilitate curative resection. In the absence of level 1 evidence, the optimal or standard multimodal strategy remains undefined. The use of bleomycin in the treatment of men with metastatic penile cancer was associated with an acceptable level of toxicity and is discouraged. Surgical consolidation to achieve disease-free status or palliation should be considered in fit patients with a proven objective response to systemic chemotherapy. Among patients who progress through chemotherapy, surgery is not recommended. Surveillance Initial treatment of the primary tumor and lymph nodes dictates the follow-up schedule. Follow-up for all patients includes a clinical exam of the penis and inguinal region. Imaging is not routinely indicated for early disease except for obese patients or patients who have undergone inguinal surgery since a physical exam may be challenging, but may be used upon abnormal findings. For patients with N2 or N3 disease, imaging of the chest, abdomen, and pelvic area is recommended. Recurrence Invasive disease is an adverse finding after initial organ sparing treatment that warrants partial or total penectomy. For non-invasive primary tumor recurrences, penile, repeat penile sparing options can be considered. A recurrence in the inguinal region carries a poor prognosis, median survival of less than 6 months, and op optimal management remains elusive. If no prior inguinal lymphadenoc nectomy or RT was given, primary treatment for the management of inguinal lymph nodes can be followed. If the patient previously received lymphadenectomy or RT, subsequent line therapies include chemotherapy followed by inguinal lymph node dissection, inguinal lymph node alone, inguinal lymph node dissection alone, or chemoradiotherapy if no prior RT. A recent study suggests that inguinal lymph node dissection may be beneficial in patients with penile cancer with locally recurrent inguinal lymph node metastasis. While potentially curative, Patient must be advised of the high incidence of postoperative complications. Metastatic disease. Imaging of the abdomen and pelvis should be obtained when metastasis is suspected to evaluate for pelvic and or retroperitoneal lymph nodes. Systemic chemotherapy, RT, or chemoradiotherapy may be considered for the treatment of metastatic disease. The NCCN panel did not recommend regimens containing bleomycin because of high pulmonary-related toxicity. Patients with a proven objective response to systemic chemotherapy are amenable to consolidative inguinal lymph node dissection with curative potential or palliation. However, Surgical consolidation should not be performed on patients with disease that progresses during systemic chemotherapy except for local symptomatic control. Preoperative RT may also be given to patients who have lymph nodes greater than or equal to 4 cm without skin fixation to improve surgical resectability and decrease local recurrence. For patients with unresectable inguinal or bone metastasis, RT may provide palliative benefit after chemotherapy. Systemic therapy may also be considered upon disease progression. The NCCN panel strongly recommends consideration of clinical trial participation as data are limited in the second-line setting. However, in select patients, paclitaxel or cetuximab may be considered, especially if previous treatments did not include a similar class of agent. Pembrolizumab is preferred in the second-line setting for patients with microsatellite instability high or mispatch repair deficient penile cancer. Best supportive care remains an option for advanced cases or cases refractory to systemic therapy, RT, or chemoradiotherapy. 
Squamous cell carcinoma of the penis is a disease that mandates prompt medical surgical intervention and patient compliance to obtain the most favorable outcomes. A thorough history and physical exam is the initial step in this process, followed by a biopsy of the primary lesion to establish a pathologic diagnosis. Accurate clinical staging allows for a comprehensive treatment approach to be devised, thus optimizing therapeutic efficacy and minimizing treatment-related morbidity. Prognostic factors help predict if lymph node metastases are suspected in the absence of any palpable inguinal lymph adenopathy. When clinically indicated, an inguinal lymph node dissection has curative potential, particularly when performed early with contemporary surgical series demonstrating its reduced morbidity. Non-squamous malignant neoplasms of the penis Basal cell carcinoma represents a highly curable variant with a relatively low metastatic potentials. Sarcomas are prone to local recurrence. Regional and distant metastases are rare. Superficial lesions can be treated with less radical procedures. Melanoma is an aggressive form of penile cancer but can be cured if diagnosed and treated with appropriate surgical procedure at an early stage. Novel immunotherapy strategies may improve survival in recurrent or advanced disease. EMPD disseminates by intradermal, intraepidermal spread initially. Wide local excision to achieve negative margins is the therapy of choice. Invasive, invasive EMPD can be lethal. Penile metastasis most often represents spread from a clinically obvious existing primary tumor. Prognosis is poor and therapy should be directed toward the primary tumor site, histology, and local palliation. <music>